Once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world. More particularly to all Shepherds Rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. I would like to read this side of ages on page 235. It says here, The Jews misinterpreted and misapplied the word of God, and they, and they knew not the time of their visitation. The years of the ministry of Christ and his apostles, the precious last years of grace to the chosen people, they spent in plotting the destruction of the Lord's messengers. Earthly ambitions absorbed them, and the offer of the spiritual kingdom came to them in vain. So today, the kingdom of this world absorbs men's thoughts, and they take no note of the rapidly fulfilling prophecies and the tokens of the swift coming kingdom of God. Desire of Ages 235. Here in Tuazar, page 178, it says, Christ had bidden his people to watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. And when these things begin to come to pass, he said, Then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21, verse 28. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Matthew 24, verse 32 and verse 33. Then the shepherd's rod says, While the Savior has clearly pointed out the nearness of His coming to the generation that shall witness all these signs, He has not left us in darkness as to how long it will be from the time of the fulfillment of these signs to that great and glorious event. For He added, this generation, the one that has seen the signs, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Verse 34, and it says, As the generation spoken of by the Master is about to pass away, and the kingdom of everlasting life ushered in, the searcher of truth should not neglect his opportunity by allowing things of lesser importance to occupy his mind or time. To us are page 178. Reading the great controversy, let's read the statement here. Um, 370 and 371. It says, No man knoweth the day nor the hour, was the argument most often brought forward by rejectors of the Advent faith. The scripture is, Of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, verse 36. A clear and harmonious explanation of this text was given by those who were looking for the Lord, and the wrong use made of it by their opponents was clearly shown. The words were spoken by Christ in that memorable conversation with his disciple upon Olivet, after he had for the last time departed from the temple. The disciples had asked the question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus gave them signs and said, When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verse 3 and 33. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who had lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was coming. And the parable in the same chapter contrasting the faithful and the unfaithful servant and giving the doom of him who said in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming shows in what light Christ will regard and reward those whom he finds watching and teaching his coming, and those denying it. Watch therefore, he says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and 
Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 3, verse 3. Paul speaks of a class to whom the Lord's appearing will come unawares. The day of the Lord so coming as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. And they shall not escape. But he adds, To those who have given heed to the Savior's warning, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children, ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. Thus it was shown that scripture gives no warrant for men to remain in ignorance concern, concerning the nearness of Christ's coming. But those who desired only an excuse to reject the truth close their ears to this explanation and the words no man knoweth the day nor the hour continued to be echoed by the bold scoper and even by the professed minister of Christ. As the people were roused and began to inquire the way of salvation, religious teachers stepped in between them and the truth, seeking to quiet their fears by falsely interpreting the word of God. Unfaithful watchmen united with the work of the great deceiver, crying, Peace, peace. When God had not spoken peace, like the Pharisees in Christ's day, many refused to enter the kingdom of heaven themselves, and those who were entering in, they hindered. The blood of these souls will be required at their hand. Great Controversy 371 and 372. Reading words to the letter of love on page 4 and page 5. It says, Will not the day and hour of Jesus appearing be made known by the voice of the eternal God? And it says, That the day and hour will be known by the true children of God. And no others appears plain from the fact that we are exhorted to watch for it. And if we do not watch, Jesus will come on us as a thief. And we shall not know what hour he will come upon us. So that none but those who truly watch and hold fast will know the true time. Revelation 3 verse 2 and 3. Here I will introduce a quotation from the true midnight cry of August 22. 1844, saying, Concerning the time of that Christ coming, he says in Mark 13, verse 32, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. It is thought by many that this passage proves that men are never to know the time. But if it proves this, it likewise proves that the Son of God himself is never to know the time. For the passage declares precisely the same concerning him that it does concerning angels and men. But can any person believe that our glorious Lord, to whom all power in heaven and earth is given, is and will remain ignorant of the time until the very moment that he comes to judge the world? If not, then certainly this text can never prove that men may not be made to understand the time. An old English version of the passage reads, But that day and hour no man make it known, neither the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. This is the correct reading according to several of the ablest critics of the age. The word no is used here in the same sense as it is by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 2. Paul will understand, well understood many other things besides Christ and Him crucified, but he determined to make known nothing else among them. So in the passage first quoted, it is declared that none but God the Father make it known the day and hour, that is, the definite time of the second coming of His Son. And this necessarily implies that God makes the time known. Words to the left of length, pages 4 and page 5. Therefore, the voice of inspiration is plainly telling that those verses that have been quoted can never be construed that the time of Christ's coming will never be revealed, will never be made known. But rather, the passage is only declaring that the information by which the coming of Christ will be made manifest or will be made known does not come to the Son of God, or does not come from the Son of God, nor from the angels, nor from men, but it cometh from God the Father. 
according to the voice of inspiration. Now, since in um, Words to the Little Flock on page 5, the verse that had been quoted is Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Now, let us read the statement in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, 190. Let us read the statement given by the voice of inspiration. Volume 2, page 190. It says here, Jesus has left us word. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. We are waiting and watching for the return of the master, who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. What time is he referred to? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No, but to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. When he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with the garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 190 and 191. The voice of inspiration is plainly telling us that the coming mentioned in that verse in Mark 13, verse 32 to verse 34, is not the visible coming of Jesus Christ, but rather Christ's coming or Christ returning to the most holy place according to the reading. It says, but rather to Christ's return from the, His ministration in the most holy holy place. Now, logically, brethren, as we are admonished by the shepherd's rod in 2TG 24, page 23, to be God's real people, logical thinkers, and not bait hunters, therefore, logically, the word return cannot be applied in October 22, 1844. Because that is the very first time when Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place. And secondly, the word return can be easily understood that he left the place and then go back. Now, I would like to read here in 2SR on page 242. It says here, that is the statement. It would have been unreasonable and an injustice to the chosen people of God if he should have left them in darkness concerning the time of the most important event of all church history, the coming of Christ. That part of the long prophetic period of the 2,300 days or years of Daniel 8 verse 14, which pertain to the Jewish nation, namely the 70 weeks of 490 years, they perfectly understood, for it was well known that the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy covering the Messiah's advent were nearly ended, and all were eager to share in that era of national glory which was then expected. 2 as our page 242. So the coming of Christ mentioned here is Christ's coming as viewed in Daniel 8 verse 14, by which such coming, according to this reading, 2SR 242, that it would have been unreasonable, and not only unreasonable, but also injustice to the chosen people of God, if God would let them in darkness concerning the time of the most important event of all church history, the coming of Christ. But what coming of Christ? The coming of Christ mentioned in Daniel 8.14. Now here in 2SR, on page 184, it says, The coming of Christ as, high, as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8 verse 14. So here, the answer is clearly given that the coming of Christ brought to view in Daniel 8.14 is Christ coming to the most holy place. But the coming mention is Christ's second coming or when Christ will return 
to the most holy place, according to the reading in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 190. Or in other words, when Jesus Christ entered in the most holy place in October 22, 1844, that is the first coming of Jesus Christ to the most holy place. And that is the commencement of the investigative judgment of the dead. Now, so the reading in 2 Asar 242 can be easily understood that Christ's second coming to the most holy place according to Testimonies Volume 2, 190, it must be pertaining to the judgment of the living. And that is why here in 2 Asar 220, let me read to you here, it says, 2 Asar 220, is there any way whereby we can determine the time of the opening of the seal and the commencement of the judgment for the living. If God so faithfully revealed to the living the commencement of the judgment for the dead, it cannot be possible he would keep secret the time of the judgment for the living. If he did, it says, we would have no present truth in the time of the last seal. Neither could there be justice in such secrecy nor could such judgment be legal. Therefore, a revelation of the judgment for the living is of as great importance as the revelation of the gospel itself. For the judgment blotting out the sins is the crowning act in the gospel of Christ. Thus, we conclude that when the seal is open and the judgment for the living begins, we must know it. The day of atonement in its type proves the same. For the Israelites were well informed of the event, their duty, and the consequence. I would like to read first uh, the Great Controversy. It says here, let's read the Great Controversy, page 400, I think 434. It says here, 430 rather. The Great Controversy, 430 and 431. It says here, the condition of the unbelieving Jews illustrates the condition of the careless and unbelieving among professed Christians who are willingly ignorant of the work of our merciful high priest. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israel, all Israel were required to gather about the sanctuary and in the most solemn manner humble their souls before God, that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. How much more essential in this antitypical day of atonement that we understand the work of our high priest and know what duties are required of us. Now, brothers and sisters, the voice of inspiration is plainly telling us in 2 SR on page 220 that if God faithfully revealed to the living the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the dead, then how much more, brothers and sisters, essential that God would reveal the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the living. And then the shepherd's rod tried to emphasize that if God would keep secret the that most important event, the judgment that pertains to the living, then such judgment is not legal. Because even, even in an earthly court, there is no such judgment than the one... Uh, to be judged, they knew nothing about it, brothers and sisters. But rather, if anybody had been accused of any crime that had been allegedly he violated, the presiding judge will send him first as someone so that he could prepare himself and to appear before the court and then to show himself if he is guilty or not. Now, here in track number 9, I remember the statement here. In track number 9, page 34, it says, If an earthly judge does not convict and condemn a criminal, it says here, track number 9, page 34, If an earthly judge does not convict and condemn a criminal without benefit of trial by jury, certainly then the all just God of heaven will not. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. And here in, uh, we call it unadventist uh, report activities. Let me read to you here. Unadventist activities research committee or reporting unadventist activities. And it is on page, that's page 15. I would like to read beginning from page 14 and then page 15. It says, has the Lord no fresh truth, no meat in due season to meet the needs of his people 
at this particular time? Has he forsaken the earth? And how will he judge the living without a message declaring that their cases are now to appear before God? So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. And he says, And how will we know when it comes if we keep our eyes and ears closed? If we do not change our present state of mind, how shall we believe even if we should accidentally hear that the message is come? And then he says in the last part, Would the judge of heaven condemn one without trial? The answer is found in track number 9, page 34, Certainly not. And how shall he judge him without summons? So, this reading is plainly telling us, brothers and sisters, that no, our Almighty God, the God of justice, He will not begin the proceedings, the judgment that pertains to the living without sending summons. And that summons, we know that that is a message issued by the presiding judge, brothers and sisters, to inform someone that he has a case and he need to appear before the court. And that is why here in Tuazar 164, let's read the statement. It says, when the judgment opened in 1844, as previously explained, the investigation began with the dead. And when that part of the work is finished, then commences the judgment of the living. While the investigation for the congregation of the dead is in progress, there can be no separation among the congregation of the living. But when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, there must be a message of present truth, sounding of the trumpet, urging everyone to lay hold on the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, by which only can he in figure come to the sanctuary, confess his sin, and secure his life. And it says, unless the close of the judgment for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth while the judgment for the living is in session. Neither would such judgment be legal or just. He who fails to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal or covering of God, and therefore must be cut off from among his people as prefigured by the services in the typical day of atonement. Now let us ponder deeply this reading, the entire paragraph. For sure, this statement is um, perfect harmony to the statement in An Adventist Activities on page 15, saying that the all Almighty God, no, He will not judge the living without first sending summons. And here, the shepherds had called it heavenly summons, that he who failed to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal or covering of God and therefore must be cut off from among his people, as prefigured by the services in the typical Day of Atonement, can be easily understood that these heavenly summons are sent by the Almighty God during the sealing of the 144,000 living saints. And any who will not respond to these heavenly summons, they will be left without the seal of the living God in their foreheads, according to this reading. And then the shepherds had also declared clearly that, but when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, there must be a message of present truth, sounding of the trumpet, urging everyone to lay hold on the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, by which only can he in figure come to the sanctuary, confess his sin, and secure his life. Or in other words, Jesus Christ, our high priest, he will not begin the proceedings that pertains to the living without sending first the present truth under the judgment that pertains to the living. The message to judge the living. Remember, brothers and sisters, in 1 is our page 28, it says that according to the scriptures, the saints of God are sealed with present truth in all ages, and whatever that present truth is, that is the seal. And the Sherpa Shad says in 2SR 215, that if the first six seals, it says, as the six seals have reference to six periods in which the saints were sealed, the seventh must also apply to a sealing period, otherwise it cannot be called the seventh seal. 
And as far as the seven seals does concern, it says, it is concerned the living. Here in 2 SR 202, it says, as there are seven seals in consecutive order, it is clear that our world history is divided into seven different periods. The judgment begins with the first and ends with the last. Evidently, the first six seals complete the cases of those who were dead preceding the judgment and while it is in session. But the seventh sealing period being the last must concern the living. So, the sealing under the seventh seal, the concern is the living or the saints that will no longer to taste death. And since all the saints of God are sealed with present truth in all ages, according to a reading in 1SR page 28, therefore the shepherd says that before our high priest begin the atonement for the living, there must be a message of present truth first to be sent by God. And the shepherd says unless the close of the judgment of, uh, for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth while the judgment for the living is in session. This reading can be easily understood, brothers and sisters, since present truth comes only from God. 11 Symbolic Code, number 3, page 5. Present truth comes only from God. Therefore, it is the absolute prerogative of God unto whom he will commit the present truth. Because the, the present truth, according to 2TG 29, on page, um, let us read the statement here, page 7, since present truth committed to an individual, 2TG 29, page 7, so the present truth comes from God. 11 symbolic code number 3, page 5. But it is the prerogative of God whom he will choose by which the present truth he will commit because according to that reading in 2TG 29 7, present truth is committed to an individual. But accordingly, brothers and sisters, in 2SR 125, that God's church in every generation is well marked by obedience of present truth. Therefore, it can be easily understood that wherever the present truth can be found, that is the church recognized by God as His. Because present truth comes from God. Illogical that God will entrust His present truth to the church by which He does not recognize as His church. And that is why it says that the church of God in all ages is well marked by obedience to present truth. And the shepherd says here in 2SR 164 saying that Unless the close of the judgment for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth while the judgment for the living is in session. Or in other words, when the judgment for the living is in session, the strongest proof that the present truth is bestowed by God into that movement it is uh, because they have the complete information when the judgment for the dead close and the commencement for the living begins. Because the shepherd's rod says that unless the close of the judgment for the dead be made known to us and the commencement for the living be made known to us, then we would have no present truth while the judgment for the living is in session. But the thing is very clear that before the judgment for the living is in session, as answered in the upper paragraph, but when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, so that statement, begin the atonement for the living, that is the time when the judgment for the living is in session. But before that, it says there must be a message of present truth first. Or in other words, since present truth comes from God, God will send present truth first. Sounding of the trumpet, urging everyone to lay hold on the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, come to the sanctuary, confess his sin, and secure his life. But how do we know that such movement, the present truth under the judgment that pertains to the living, the present truth by which intended to the living saints, 
when the judgment for the living is in session, is bestowed into that movement. The answer given here, it says, Unless the clause of the judgment for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth, while the judgment for the living is in session. Or in other words, when the judgment for the living is in session, and we have no knowledge when the judgment for the dead close, and we have no knowledge when the judgment for the living commence, we have no present truth. And since we have no present truth, brothers and sisters, then such movement cannot be of God. Because there must be a movement by which God will deposit His present truth into that movement, brothers and sisters, according to um, the voice of inspiration. And that is why the statement says that in an Adventist report activity saying, Has the Lord no fresh truth? Going back again on an Adventist activities on page 14 and 15. Has the Lord no fresh truth to meet in due season, to meet the needs of His people at this particular time? Has He forsaken the earth? And how will he judge the living without a message declaring that their cases are now to appear before God? So there must be a message declaring that their cases are now to appear before God. And that is the heavenly summons. And that's why in 2TG number 12, it says here on page 29, the revelation moreover in the following verses again and again endeavors to make us see that the event therefore trade is the judgment in session. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. And I saw thrones, John declares, and judgment was given unto them. John truly penned it as a prophecy. But when it actually takes place, then God's agency on earth, the spirit of prophecy in the church, is to proclaim that the event has actually taken place. Brethren, it's high time now, brothers and sisters, that we need to seriously study what does it mean that the spirit of prophecy in the church is to proclaim that the event has actually taken place. Does the spirit of prophecy mentioned here, brothers and sisters, represented by the books, or is it represented by the medium, the channel used by God to inform God's people that the judgment for the living is actually taking place? Remember the statement in, I would like to read first, in track number 6, on page 43, it says here, on track number 6, page 43, Have you not yet discovered that whether it be in ancient or in modern times, all the Bible truths that men have ever learned have come only through the inspired channel, the spirit of prophecy? So the spirit of prophecy, brothers and sisters, that spirit represents the spirit of Christ. And when that spirit of Christ entered into that channel, he began to prophesy. And for sure, his prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And that is also stated in 2TG uh, 45, right? In 2TG number 45 on page 6, and you can read the entire page saying, And what is the spirit of prophecy? The same chapter and verse give the answer. Revelation 19 verse 10. So here the shepherds are plainly telling us that the spirit of prophecy is pointing to the human channel by which the spirit of Christ is manifested into the channel and then he began to prophesy by which such prophecy that he uttered is called the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you can uh, post then two paragraphs. I will no longer read. You can read at your own leisure. Now here in Old Symbolic Code, let me read to you brothers and sisters. And I think the same uh, statement. Here in Old Symbolic Code, the statement given by uh, the voice of inspiration, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, plainly telling us here on 5 Symbolic Code 1 to 5, page 6. 5 Symbolic Code 1 to 5, page 6, it says, In the last book of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 17, we find that the devil will be especially wroth with those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which the author of the book tells us is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 verse 10. Then it says, And the apostle Peter makes it clear that the testimony of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy are the spirit of Christ in the prophets, 
who testified beforehand. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11. Thus it was in the apostles' time that it must be now, since the testimonies come from the Spirit of Him who spake as no man ever spake. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters, according to um, the voice of inspiration. Here in Acts of the Apostles uh, 222, it says here, I would like to read, By the inspired testimony of Moses, and the prophets, he clearly proved the identity of Jesus of Nazareth with the Messiah and showed that from the days of Adam, it was the voice of Christ which had been speaking through patriarchs and prophets. And that is why it is called the testimony of Jesus Christ and beginning in the days of Adam. Acts of the Apostles, page 222. Therefore, the testimony of Jesus Christ cannot be applied to the right things because in the days of Adam there was no yet written records and even Enoch the description given by patriarchs and prophets page 85 it says through holy angels God revealed to Enoch his purpose to destroy the world by a flood and he also opened more fully to him the plan of redemption by the spirit of prophecy he carried him down through the generations that should live after the flood and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. You see, brothers and sisters, how Enoch prophesied. It says, by the spirit of prophecy, or in other words, through the spirit of Christ, Enoch had been able to prophesy, brothers and sisters, the future events. So the spirit of prophecy cannot be referred to the writings because the written records begins in the days of Moses. But the spirit of prophecy says the spirit of prophecy commences in the days of Adam, brothers and sisters. Now, let us go back again to our reading, very important, concerning the time of prophecy. And it is more pertaining to the returning of Christ into the most holy place. By which at that time, Jesus Christ will wear the garments of vengeance. And it is closely connected to our study concerning the five symbolical months because it was in five symbolical months that vengeance is deferred to grace. Now, to repeat again, brothers and sisters, I would like to read first uh, 11 symbolic code. Number 11 symbolic code, number 12, page 7. So, I would like to read that statement. It says, If no one is to know the day and hour until the Lord comes, then how could the servant be aware of the day and the hour? Do you see that one statement seems to contradict the other? And it is synonymous in the great controversy saying in 370, One saying of the Savior must not destroy another. And there is similarity of the explanation given by Sister White and also given by B.T. Houghton. To repeat again, in the great controversy 370, the spur prophecy declared clearly that one saying of the Savior must not destroy or it should, not, it should not be understood to destroy another statement, brothers and sisters. But here it says, let us read again, 11 symbolic code, number 12, page 7. It says, if no one is to know the day and hour until the Lord comes, then how could the servant be aware of the day and the hour? Or in other words, no, God will not uh, utter a command. By which in, in reality, there is no possibility to uh, obey such command given by God. And otherwise, God is a cruel God, brothers and sisters. If we will be saying that He is commanding and He is giving an admonition, giving an instructions. By which in reality, it is impossible to obey. So when God uh, commanded His people to to watch so that they could be aware of that day and hour, according to the shepherd's rod, then if no one is to know the day and the hour, then how they could be able to be aware of that day and that hour? And then it says, do you see that one statement seems to contradict the other? But it did not can contradict, but it says, it seems. But in reality, it does not contradict. It says, no one knows the hour, the day. Therefore, God's people must be ready for the event to occur at almost any time. 
And if this servant does not faithfully perform his duties, then when the Lord is about to come, that servant will not be aware of it. Is that not how you understand these two statements? Up to a certain time, God's people do not know the day and the hour. But if they continue to receive meat in due season, a day will come when the servant is going to be made aware of that hour of that day. But what hour and what day mentioned here? That is Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is not the visible coming of Jesus Christ. Let us first establish. The coming mentioned here is the coming mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 36 up to verse 44. Now, does the shepherd's rod teach us that uh, Matthew 24 is the second visible coming of Jesus Christ? For example, I would like to read in Answerer number 2, page 24. It says, Moreover, this secret coming, Matthew 24, verse 36, and the other term of secret coming is invisible coming. Maybe another than that commonly understood as the second coming. So Matthew 24 verse 36. The common understanding of Advent Bible students. They thought that the coming mentioned there in Matthew 24 and also Mark 13, 32 to 34 is the second visible coming of Jesus Christ. But in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, 190, it says no. It is not the second visible coming of Jesus Christ, but to His return from His ministration to the most holy place. Now, here's another statement here in a 2SR page 184. It says here, let us read a statement. The virgins were called to meet Him, and thus by faith go in with Him to appear before the Father, the great judge. The seal is the permit. It places their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, and thus it grants to them the right to appear before the Father in the judgment, not in person, but in figure, thus having their sins blotted out. Matthew 24, verse 36 and 50 are descriptions of the same event. What's therefore, for you know, neither the day nor the hour in the Son of Man cometh. This has reference to the time of the judgment and not of his coming to earth. For the saints shall know the day and hour of Christ's coming in the clouds to receive the redeem as it shall be announced by the Father shortly before his coming. See the great controversy 640. Now here the shepherd's rod plainly told us that the parable in Matthew 25 and the parable in Matthew 24 verse 36 and verse 50 it says are descriptions of the same event. And what event? No, it is not the second visible coming of Jesus Christ, but this has reference to the time of the judgment and not of his coming to earth. So it is the time of the judgment or Christ coming to the most holy place. The same statement in Testimonies Volume 2, 190. Saying, brothers and sisters, that that is Christ returning to the most holy place by which at that time he will clothe himself with the garments of vengeance and then pronounce the irrevocable decision. Now, in the great controversy, let us read the great controversy on page 490. Let us read the statement here given by the voice of inspiration. The great controversy, page 490. It says, and we will be reading at least three paragraphs. It says, solemn are the sins connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Therefore, since 1844, and this great controversy was written in 1888. So it was already 44 years from 1844. Now, let's read again. It says, The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. And it says, In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Mark 13, verse 33. But we already read in volume 2, 190, the time mentioned there cannot be the second visible coming of Jesus Christ, but rather His coming and returning 
to the most holy place. And it says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 3 verse 3. When the work of the investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. Christ in the revelation, looking forward to that time, declares, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22 verse 11 and verse 12. The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. Before the flood, after Noah entered the ark, God shut him in and shut the ungodly out. But for seven days, the people knowing, knowing not that their doom was fixed, continued their careless, pleasure-loving life and marked the warnings of impending judgment. So says the Savior, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24 verse 39. Silently and notice as the midnight thief will come the decisive hour which marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercy, offer to guilty men. Now, let us ponder deeply, brothers and sisters, this reading. And in the last paragraph, it says, What's ye there for? Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Mark 13, verse 35 and verse 36. Perilous is the condition of those who, growing weary of their watch, turn to the attractions of the world, while the man of business is absorbed in the pursuit of gain, while the pleasure lover is seeking indulgence, while the daughter of passion is arranging her adornments. It may be in that hour the judge of all the earth will pronounce the sentence, Thou art weighed in the balance, in the balances, and are found one thing. Daniel chapter 5 verse 27. Now I would like to focus to the reading saying the irrevocable decision had been pronounced in the heavenly sanctuary while the righteous are still in their mortal state. Now I would like to read um, a statement in 1888. Let me see if I could find that statement. Saying that um, in God's kingdom Brothers and sisters, I would like to read this thing, written by Alonso, T. Alonso Jones. It says, Jesus said the saints will be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. Luke 14 verse 14. So I would like to read again the statement. Um, I think it is written from American Sentinel. Uh, Page 379. So let us read here the statement given by this prophecy. Jesus said, The saints will be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. Luke 14 verse 14. The resurrection of the just takes place when Christ himself returns to the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 to 17. But it's pointing to the general resurrection of the righteous. The first general resurrection. At the coming of Christ, the saints inherit or enter into and possess the kingdom. Matthew 25 verse 31 to 34. And they cannot inherit it before the resurrection. So concerning to the saints, the taste that are all of them who died under the first six seals, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God or they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless they will be resurrected. And it says here, For Paul says that flesh and blood, man in a mortal state, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither that corruption inherit in corruption. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50. Christ's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom which cannot be inherited by dying people. They must first be immortalized by the resurrection or a translation. God had chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which yet promised to them that love him. James 2 verse 5. They who are rich in faith and love God are now heirs of the kingdom. 
They will inherit it when Jesus comes and redeems them from the bondage of corruption. And it says, see Romans 8 verse 23 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 4. Or in other words, the, the voice of inspiration is plainly telling brothers and sisters that when that kingdom that will be established by which we commonly call as the premillennial kingdom, no, none can enter into that kingdom in their mortal state, brothers and sisters. They must be immortalized first. And the saints that experience death, they will be immortalized by resurrection. But the saints that will no longer to taste death, they will be immortalized by translation. And in the book of Revelation, as explained by the Shepherd's Rod, it was illustrated in track number 15, I would like to read track number 15. At the time when there are already saints standing on the sea of glass, meaning immortality is granted to the saints, the living saints, brothers and sisters. And that is why the illustration is that um, there are saints standing on the sea of glass. Uh, let me, I think that is in track number 15, saying that um, the at the second session, brothers and sisters, or the second sitting, it says here in page 19 and 20, in track number 15, that the dead are judged in the first session, and the living in the second, is seen from the symbolization itself, as upper pointed out at the first sitting, no one stands on the sea of glass, and the sea itself is, is as clear as crystal. But at the second sitting, the saints stand on the sea and it is mingled with fire, symbol of life. Track number 15, page 19 and page 20. Now let's go back again, brothers and sisters, in, in the reading in the Great Controversy 490 and 491. And this prophecy is plainly telling in this paragraph that the irrevocable decision is pronounced in the heavenly sanctuary while the righteous are still in their mortal state. Or in other words, since the um, immortality will be granted to the saints who experience grave and death, Therefore, the irrevocable decision will be pronounced in the heavenly sanctuary before any of the saints will be resurrected. Because when the saints will be resurrected, immortality is granted. But the voice of inspiration says that this irrevocable decision will be pronounced in the heavenly sanctuary while the righteous are still in their mortal state. And secondly, the saints that will no longer to taste death at that time Immortality was not yet granted to them. And then, the irrevocable decision were already pronounced in the heavenly sanctuary. And what irrevocable decision, brothers and sisters? That is the prediction given in Revelation 22, verse 11 and verse 12. Now, in selected messages, I would like to read the reading here in uh, selected messages. In uh, book 1, page 72, it says here, it says the statement given uh, by... It's for privacy. Rebellion will exist as long as Satan exists. Those who are actuated by his spirit will not discern the spirit of God or listen to his voice until the mandate shall go forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. 1SM, page 172. In 125, 1SM, it says here, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 125. In 1844, our great high priest entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of the investigative judgment. The cases of the righteous dead had been passing in review before God. When that work shall be completed, judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. Look at the statement. When that work shall be completed, the judgment that pertains to the dead, Judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. So Revelation 22 verse 11 and 12, such pronouncement is upon the living because those who are already dead, they were already unconscious, lying unconscious in their graves. They knew nothing. And how could it be that it will be say that he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. So that statement is pronounced upon the living. Now let's read again. It says, When that work shall be completed, the judgment that pertains to the dead, Judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. How precious, how important are these solemn moments. Each of us has a case pending in the court of heaven. 
we are individually to be judged according to the deeds done in the body. In the typical service, when the work of atonement was performed by the high priest in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary, the people were required to afflict their souls before God and confess their sins that they might be atoned for and blotted out. Will any less be required of us in this antitypical day of atonement? When Christ in the sanctuary above is pleading in behalf of his people and the final irrevocable decision is to be pronounced upon every case. 1 SM page 125 and I cannot imagine brothers and sisters that statement that there are people who are willingly ignorant or in other words it seems that that is their their choice brothers and sisters to to remain ignorant according to the great controversy 430 the condition of the unbelieving Jews illustrate the condition of the careless and unbelieving among professed Christians who are willingly ignorant of the work of our merciful high priest. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israelites were required to gather about the sanctuary and in the most solemn manner humble their souls before God that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. How much more essential in this antitypical day of atonement that we understand the work of a high priest and know what duties are required of us. Remember the shepherds that says in track number 3, let's read a statement here in track number 3 on page 54, it says, brothers and sisters, important as it is, any who would fail to make a diligent and careful study of the nature and significance of this great work of God's investigating the guests who came in for the wedding are simply indifferent to the prospects of eternal life. So great salvation. For when a person's judgment is pending and he is unaware of the fact, he will be unprepared and unable to stand when his case is investigated. So that is very plain. It says, brothers and sisters, for when a person's judgment is pending and he is unaware of the fact, then he will be unprepared and unable to stand when his case will be investigated. So that is very fatal, brothers and sisters, to each one of us to remain in ignorant. Here in 2 SR page 219, I would like to read to you. 2 SR page 219. It says here, while the judgment for the living is in progress, every sin must be confessed and put away. He who would neglect this great privilege will find himself in bold, in everlasting ruin, cut off from among his people. Ignoring this most vital subject will not profit us in the least. If you will ignore this subject, brothers and sisters, this is, um, this is one of the most vital subjects. You will not be profited by it, brothers and sisters. And it only bring you ruin. You will be involved in such everlasting ruin according to the voice of inspiration here in 2SR page 219. Now, going back again, to our reading in um, 11 symbolic code number 12 page 7 saying that if no one is to know the day and hour until the time the Lord comes then how could we be able to prepare that day and that hour? Remember, the coming mentioned here cannot be the visible coming of Jesus Christ. It is the coming of Christ to the most holy place. In October 22, 1844, Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place. That is Christ's first coming and that is pertaining to the judgment that pertains to the dead. But here in 2SR 241, it says, Thus it symbolically apprehends, I'm reading to us R241, thus it symbolically apprehends the saints collectively, all the saved from Adam to the end. Therefore, the prophecy by Enoch commenced its fulfillment in 1844, at which time the Lord came with the names and records of those who are sleeping in the grave. And when the investigation of the dead is finished, then he comes with the names of the living saints. So that is very plain. The second coming of Jesus Christ to the most holy place is Christ coming to the most holy place bringing the names of the living saints, 144,000. And that is the illustration, brothers and sisters, um, in 2TG42. 
Let's go back again to the reading in 2 TG number 42 on page 31. It says here, again in verse um, 47 and 48, Christ draws a parallel between the church and net, the people he likens to fish and the purification to a separation. Whereas in Matthew 25, he calls the purified church the kingdom of God and the people he likens unto virgins and the cleansing he illustrates by a door, by which lets, by which lets in the the wise but keeps out the foolish. 2 TG 42 page 31. So that door by which only the wise virgins have been able to enter is the door into the most holy place. And why is it that the the, the foolish virgins had not been able to enter into the most holy place? It's because before Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place, their names had been blotted out. Why? Because the statement in 2SR 164, He who fails to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal of God. And if, if you have no seal, then you cannot enter to the most holy place because the seal is our permit. In, in 2SR page 184, it is very plain, brothers and sisters, that the virgins were called to meet Him in the most holy place and thus by faith go in with Him to appear before the Father, the great judge that is in the most holy place. 2SR184. The seal is the permit. It places their names in the Lamb's book of life. And thus it grants to them the right to appear before the Father in the judgment, not in person, but in figure, meaning their, their names had been brought into the most holy place. And what is their permit? That is the seal. I remember in uh, Bible commentary, it says here that the, the seal of the living God will be our passport. Brothers and sisters, I would like to read that reading in uh, 7 BC, a Bible commentary. It says here that the seal of the living God, uh, 7 BC 970, uh, I would like to begin in page 900. 69. It says here, And every man that hath this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure. In a little while, everyone who is a child of God will have the, his seal pl placed upon him, or that it may be placed upon our foreheads. Who can endure the thought of being passed by when the angel goes forth to seal the servants of God in their foreheads? Passport to the holy city. Only those who receive the seal of the living God will have the passport through the gates of the holy city. But there are many who take upon themselves responsibilities in connection with the work of God who are not wholehearted believers. And while they remain thus cannot receive the seal of the living God, they trust in their own righteousness which the Lord accounts as foolishness. 7 BC 969 and 970. Therefore, the, the seal of the living God is our passport. And in 2SR 184, the seal of the living God is our permit that it grants us to enter into the most holy place. And this Jesus Christ who will bring our names in, in the most holy place according to 2SR 241. But the foolish virgins then not been able to enter into the most holy place because their names in the holy place had been blotted out. Why? Because they failed to receive or they failed to respond to the heavenly somos. And that heavenly somos is what constitute as the present truth under the seven seal. As we read at several times in 2SR page 164. Now, I would like to uh, re-emphasize again, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, those passages that we already read before we could be able to proceed in this subject, the time prophecy. Now, to repeat again, in 2SR 242, the Shepherd's Rod made it so plain that it is unreasonable, and not only unreasonable, but also injustice to the chosen people of God. If God would left them in darkness concerning to the time of the most important time of the history of the church, which is the coming of Christ. What coming mentioned? According to the reading, 2SR 242, the coming mentioned in Daniel 8 verse 14. And we already read in 2SR 184, that the coming of Christ brought to view in Daniel 8 verse 14 is Christ coming to the most holy place. But the also fact is that the uh, parable in Matthew 24 verse 36, the shepherd's rod called it Christ's secret coming in answer number 2 page 24. 
But in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 190, it is Christ's second coming to the most holy place or Christ's return or returning into the most holy place by which after he blot out all the, the sins of the penitent believers, he will clothe himself with the garments of vengeance according to that vision that was shown by God to uh, Sister White in volume 2, 190 and 191. And that is the coming mentioned, brothers and sisters, that when we read Great Controversy 370 and 371 saying that, no, the scripture gives no warrant that such coming will not be made known. And as a matter of fact, in the words to the little flat, page 4, plainly declared that the, uh, the coming of Christ or it will, be no, it will be made known by the true children of God. That is very plain, brothers and sisters, here in page, page 4. It says that the day and hour will be known by the true children of God. So it will be known by the true children of God. And who will uh, made known to them? That is God the Father. So the source of such information does not originate from Jesus Christ, neither from the angels, neither from the Son of Man, but such information had been um, the source coming from God the Father Himself, according to uh, the voice of inspiration here in Words to the Little Plot, page 4. And the shepherd's rod, plainly declared that 11 symbolic code number 12 page 7 saying that if no one is to know the day and the hour of Christ's coming then how could God's people be able to prepare for themselves to be ready um, in that coming of Jesus Christ even the second visible coming of Jesus Christ according to 2SR 184 and 185 God the Father will announce that coming of Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ will come in order to prepare for that event. How much more to that second invisible coming of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, that God's people are commanded to watch. And the shepherd says that if no one is to know the day and the hour of Christ's coming, then how could that servant be aware of that day and of that hour? And says, do you see, it seems that one statement contradicts the other. No one knows the day and the hour. But if they will continue to receive meat in due season, that is very plain in that reading in 11 symbolic code number 12, page 7, showing that there is an appointed time that in that meat in due season, it includes the information when the judgment for the dead will close and the judgment for the living begins. Because the second coming of Christ in 2SR 241 is Christ coming to the most holy place to judge the living, brothers and sisters, or pertaining to the judgment that pertains to the living. And that is why the Shepherd's Rod says in 2SR 220 that if God so faithfully revealed to the living the commencement of the judgment for the dead, then it is not possible that God would keep secret the time of that most important event. If He did, then we would have no present truth. And such judgment should not be legal. But the revelation of that um, commencement of the judgment that pertains to the living is of as great importance as the gospel itself. And I do believe, I do fully believe that the gospel mentioned there is more pertaining to afflict our souls or to prepare our lives so that our names will not be cut off. Therefore, such message must be proclaimed prior to the blotting out of names, brothers and sisters, because if, if the um, proclamation of the message will be proclaimed after all the names of the wicked, both to the dead and the living, are completely blotted out, and then after such event, that is the time that the message will be proclaimed, then it will be of no value because that occurrence are already finished. Therefore, there must be a message to be proclaimed prior to that blotting out of names or in other words, the statement that we shall not be cut off from among the people. The, the cut off mentioned there in 2SR 164 is the blotting out of names and that is the heavenly summons. The heavenly summons is to inform you 
that soon be soon, the judgment that pertains to the living, which is the blotting out of names, will soon begins, brothers and sisters. Because that what summons mean, to inform someone, brothers and sisters. So that in order for us, not our names to be blotted out, then uh, let us um, here in uh, White House Recruiter, page 11, the admonition given says, What is of first and supreme importance to each, however, is to know for a surety that his name is written in the book. And to have this most blessed assurance, one must first know what will keep one's name out of the book and what will put it in. Brothers and sisters, so it's very important that we need to study closely what are those things or what are those acts by which if you will do something, your name surely will be blunted out. And what are those acts that which if you will do such thing, your name's guaranteed, brothers and sisters. The statement used is ineffishably, meaning it will be forever remain in the Lamb's book of life and it will never be erased, brothers and sisters. It says here in track number 5, page 118, He who is persuaded and who walks in the light will experience joy inexpressible. He will receive the mark, Ezekiel 9 verse 4, the seal, Revelation 7 verse 2 and 3, of God's approval. It says, His sins will be blotted out. His name will be inefficiably written in the Lamb's book of life. And we know the, the word inefficiably meaning it will no longer be erased. And that act for sure is the acceptance of the present truth. And reciprocally, brothers and sisters, the act by which our names will be blotted out in the Lamb's Book of Life is rejecting present truth. Because that is the, the sin, the prominent sin recorded in track number 3 on page 7 saying that not every name that has been entered in the Lamb's books will be retained there. It's borne out with sad conclusiveness by the following scriptures. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Exodus 32 verse 33. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 22 verse 19. Therefore, the prominent act mentioned in that reading by which our names will be blotted out in the Lamb's Book of Life is sin against God. And that is the sinning against God the Holy Ghost. So here in 2SR 198, let me read to you the statement. It says, The rejecting of light and present truth is the sin against the Holy Ghost. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, which is the present truth, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Matthew 12 verse 32. Our attitude towards present truth would either make a tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Verse 33. Thus present truth has the power to change the individual and fit him for eternal life which is the seal of the living God, say Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You see, brothers and sisters, rejecting a present truth, brothers and sisters, is the sin against the Holy Ghost. And such sin will cause your name to be blotted out in the Lamb's Book of Life. But reciprocally, it says here in the upper portion, in 2SR 198, the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, the lamps of fire, seven in number, present before the throne, represent completeness of the truth of God, present truth revealed to every generation since the world begun, by which we are judged, those who are obedient to all the light and truth given them. So the statement given them, meaning the present truth that had been bestowed unto them, those who are obedient to all the light and truth concerning that present truth, have come up to the requirements, they are sealed and cleared from the condemnation of the law of God. To us our page... 198 brothers and sisters think it thoroughly my dear brothers and sisters to repeat again um, 
the most important part in this study is we need to ascertain clearly when would that be the pronouncement of the irrevocable decision. For sure, that is the day of atonement by which all the destinies of men is forever fixed. Now, here in track number 15, let me read to you. Here in track number 15, the statement given by the shepherd's rod. Track number 15 on page um, 28 and also page 29. So it says here, In the typical atonement, everyone's destiny among the professed people of God was forever fixed. And it says, Those who complied with the demands of the law were left to live, and those who did not were cut off from among the people. Thus, it must also be in the antitypical atonement. This antitypical atonement is not blotting out of sins, but rather blotting out of names. Because the voice of inspiration says, they will be cut off from among the people. And that is pointing to the final day of atonement, brothers and sisters. We know that that cleansing of the sanctuary commenced in October 22, 1844. And every year, there is a day of atonement. But we are now trying to study using the Bible and the shepherd's rod, writings of Sister White, and the Eternity message to ascertain clearly that final day of atonement or the last day of atonement by which according to track number 3, let me read to you here. Here in track number 3, the statement given here in track number 3 on page um, 73, page 73 and page 74, it says, When one is cut off from among his people on account of sin, then his name must also be blotted out of the book of the living. So it points out to the book of the living. Or in other words, this statement must be definitely applied to the judgment that pertains to the living. Consequently, the day of atonement was a day of judgment as it is still commonly called by the Jews. And by that token, it was founded as the type of that great antitypical day of atonement, the investigative judgment, the day in which the Lord will blot from his book the names of all sinners and cut off from the congregation of his people all whose names are not in the book. So the voice of inspiration says that God will cut off from the congregation of his people all whose names are not in the book. Therefore, in, in this reading, we can easily discern that the very first aspect of the judgment is book work. And book work is pertained only to the heavenly sanctuary. Now look at the statement here in answerer number 5 on page 30. Answerer number 5, page 30, it says, Why need of a judgment? Answerer number 5, page 30. That the Bible teaches of a coming judgment, no one can deny. Because the question is says, I cannot see the need of a judgment. Why should we be judged after we are saved? And the answer given by the Shambhus Rad says, That the Bible teaches of a coming judgment, no one can deny. We therefore need only to give the reason for it. The true people of God, we are told, are commingled with the untrue, the wheat with the tares. The judgment therefore is to determine who are the wheat and who are the tares and to designate the future of each. According to Jesus' parable, this work takes place in the time of harvest. The end of the world, Matthew 13 verse 30 and 40. And as the congregation of the dead as well as the congregation of the living are commingled with the good and the bad, the judgment takes place among both, first among the dead, then among the living. In the judgment, the decision is made as to who are worthy of eternal life and who are of eternal death. John chapter 5 verse 28 and verse 29. Who are to come up in the first resurrection. Revelation 20 verse 6. And who in the second. Also who are to be translated when Jesus comes. 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17. And who are to perish at the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. This is the first aspect of the judgment and being only a book work. Daniel 7 verse 10. A work that does not disturb either the dead in the graves or the living in the church. It takes place in heaven. And that is the reason why the, the great controversy says that they were unconscious. Uh, let, let me read to you here in the great controversy again in 490. The statement um, given by the spur prophecy, it says, The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth 
in their mortal state, men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. The statement unconscious meaning they have no knowledge, they have no understanding. And they are willing, ignorant. Remember, brothers and sisters, the, the voice of inspiration says that if such person's case is pending in the heavenly sanctuary and he is unaware of the fact, for sure he cannot stand when his case will be investigated. That is very plain, right? In track number 3, page 54. And as a matter of fact, the statement in track number 3 on page 54, it says, Important as it is, any who would fail to make a diligent and careful study of the nature and significance of this great work of God's investigating the guests who come in for the wedding. And as far as the shepherd's dog is thus concerned, that statement in investigating the guests is pointing to the Day of Atonement. Here in track number 15, page 29. Let us read the statement. It says, um, track number 15, page, tw page 29. Yes, any tares ever to pluck to be plucked out and set aside for destruction, and any wheat ever to be placed in the barn kingdom for the master's use, are segregated on the antitypical day of atonement. So that is the time that they are segregated on the antitypical day of atonement, brothers and sisters. So it is very important that we have a complete understanding concerning the day of atonement because when the judgment that pertains to the living, that is pertaining to the blotting out of names, brothers and sisters, the statement says, and brothers and sisters, we, we ignoring that most vital subject will not profit us in the least, according to 2SR 219. And that's why um, we are bound, uh, obligatory, brothers and sisters, to proclaim this message as God hath give graciously in our hands such information when the judgment for the living will begin. And before it will begin, we need to proclaim this message. Whether you will accept it or you will reject it, we leave the consequence into the hands of God. Our duty is just to proclaim the message. But we fully believe, brothers and sisters, that there are 144,000 living saints that will respond to the heavenly summons. As stated in 2SR. Here in 2SR 164, it says here, Therefore, 2SR 164, Therefore it is evident that in the purification or separation of the tares from the wheat in the church of God, there shall be 144,000 who had confessed their sins and are thus made white and clean by the precious blood of Christ, for they are the first fruits. So it is predicted beforehand that there are 144,000. Or in other words, brothers and sisters, the, the statement given by the shepherd's rod says that the church will not sleep forever. The true people of God will be profited with this rousing call. According to 2 TG 24 page 23, it says, The church therefore... 2 TG 24-23 The church therefore will not sleep forever. The true people of God will awake to their poverty. That is spiritual poverty. And the only riches spiritually is the present truth. And if the present truth is not within our borders, then we are in deepest spiritual poverty. Or in other words, the statement saying the church therefore will not sleep forever, the true people of God will be awakened to their poverty, meaning they will discover that they were destitute of the present truth. And because of that, they will respond to the call. They will profit at this rousing call. But the dragon's blood will fill the bowels of the earth. So brothers and sisters, to repeat again, it's very important to have a complete understanding concerning the very important event, the Day of Atonement, the final Day of Atonement, by which after that final Day of Atonement, let us read in track number 3 again, on page 73 and page 74, being the Day of Atonement in type for both the dead and the living. So in that final Day of Atonement, brothers and sisters, we know that the Day of Atonement is consists only one day. Here in track number 3 on page, let me read to you the statement here in page 18, it says in the early sanctuary, uh, track number 3, page 18, 
in the earthly sanctuary, the high priest, Taipipai in Christ, officiated first in the holy apartment throughout the year. Then upon the day of atonement, the day of cleansing the sanctuary and judging the people, he officiated in the most holy for one day only. So the day of atonement is only 24 hours, one day only. And it says, being the day of atonement in time for both the dead and the living. It points out to the final day of atonement. This service of the earthly tabernacle therefore projects the day of atonement in its antitype. The cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven from the unworthy names in the books. And it says, um, and the cleansing of the church on earth from its unconverted and unstable members. Thus bringing the time of clean books, clean church, and clean people. So, after that day of atonement, it says, then it brings to the time of clean books, clean church, and clean people. Or in other words, that is called the purified church of God. The kingdom that we have been studied, brothers and sisters, that the kingdom is already in existence after that day of atonement. And we will give you all the necessary information, brothers and sisters, to prove that God did not left His people in darkness concerning that very important event, Christ coming to the most holy place for the investigative judgment that pertains to the living, brothers and sisters. Because if God faithfully revealed to the living the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the dead, then there is no reason that God would keep secret the most important event, the judgment that pertains to the living. As a matter of fact, in Jesu letter number 2, page 2, brothers and sisters, the judgment for the living is even more important than the judgment that pertains to the dead. And in General Conference Special, page 39, saying, brothers and sisters, that accordingly, the three angels' messages are directly applied to the judgment that pertains to the living. And it is applied to the dead only indirectly because the angels are not sent to explain what the judgment is to do to the dead, but rather what it is to do to the living. So we will continue this subject, brothers and sisters, and hoping that the good Lord will bless you and will give you more courage, strength, zeal, and fervent desire to continue searching, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much for listening and viewing this program. May the good Lord bless you. Have a wonderful evening.